Well, good morning, church. 2019, unreal, eh? Wow. Time just flew by. We had an awesome year in 2018. Uh, we want, I'd like to thank you for your faithfulness when it comes to your generosity and also uh, your involvement. It was a great year as a church. And, uh, and we continue to invite you to be generous and to invest in God's kingdom in GMC, through GMC. What we want to see in the next year is uh, we want to be uh, gospel focused. We want to be, we want to reach more. Uh, we want to reach our community more. We want to reach our, our province, our world. We want to get involved in more church planting and uh, that's pretty exciting. So we invite you to continue to be generous and uh, if, you have, if you haven't um, experienced uh, the principle of tithing, putting God first in your finances. I invite you, I dare challenge you to do that. The Bible says that if you, if you it, it talks about a giving and, and putting God first in your finances and God will open up the, the windows of heaven. He invites us to test him. It's one of the only places in the Bible where we're called to test God, to say, hey, challenge me in this and I will open this, the, the gates of heaven. So I invite you to continue to be generous. And uh, like Brenton was saying, we are entering a time of fasting and it's pretty cool. Uh, it's always a great time for the church to come together. And the purpose of, uh, of fasting, it's to get closer to God. Uh, we we want to see God work in our lives. And, and what we want to do in this time is we want to set some time aside where we say, God, we want you more than, than the things of life. We want to experience you. So like Brendan was saying, we invite you to jump on board, participate. Uh, and like, like he mentioned, you'll be blessed uh, by connecting with God. You won't... Uh, uh, you won't miss out. If you, if you focus on God and you put your energy on pursuing him, you'll find him. It's going to make a huge difference in your life. And if you have your card, the card, I invite you to pick it up. I invite, it to, I invite you to put it in your Bible or put it in your stuff to bring it home. But just to give you a little snapshot of uh, the theme or the thing that we would like to pray for, there's a, we, we, could, we could have a list of 100 things. And, and the priority, the number one, is to see souls, uh, prodigals come to the Lord, right? To see people experience God for the first time and also see prodigals returning home. But what we have here is four things we want you to pray for. Uh, we'll be starting uh, this year a discipleship school starting September. And we, we, we pray that we'll have at least 10 students. And what we want to do is we want to train the next generation. And it's going to be an a, a eight, month, eight months um, discipleship course and uh, we invite uh, we, 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 we invite you to pray for this we'd like to see we would like to see this grow in our church secondly um, we have a prayer summit where we have a, where the saints come together where the church comes together to pray we have around an, av- an attendance of a hundred people that come that comes to pray uh, it would be awesome if we could see 200 this year I, I believe that we need to grow in prayer corporately and uh, so may you pray for, for God to move in our church that we would see the value and the importance of prayer. Thirdly, um, I invite you to pray for the leading when it comes to uh, the future of GMC, when it comes to land and new facility and all that God has in store, the finances, the planning. I invite you to pray for that. And like I, men- I mentioned earlier, I invite you to pray for, uh, for, uh, for the church when it comes to mission. Uh, there's so many places that we can get involved in, and what we want to do is we want to do God's will, so we, we want to align ourselves with what God has in store. So I invite you to pray for, for God's leading when it comes to church planting, outreach. Uh, like I said, we, wanna be a, we want to have an outward focus, and, and we want to reach our world, so we want to pray for that. So I invite you to jump on board, be part of this, and, uh, and I think it's going to be awesome because I know that God has a tremendous year ahead of us, and we want to step in and all that God has in store. Amen? All right. So I would ask you to stand. We'll place ourselves before the Lord as we go to his word. Father God, we we thank you so much that you are here in this place and that you want to speak to us. You want to reveal yourself to us. So we open our hearts up to what you want to say. We open our hearts up to your word. Mm, Father, I thank you that you know where each of us are and uh, you have a word for us. For those watching on the web, I pray that you would speak to them. For all of us that are here we, we say yes to what you want to convey. We say yes to your, the seed, your word that doesn't return void. We want to see your word penetrate our hearts in a new way. Father, we want more. 
We want more of you in us. We want to grow in the thing that concerns you. So we pray that this morning will, uh, would be a platform for you to intervene, to speak, and to have your way. So Father, we thank you that your word doesn't come with condemnation. Your word comes to build us up and draw us closer to you so that we would, we would know you more, so that we would trust you more, so that we would walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me grab a seat. So we're starting this new series uh, this morning called Setbacks to Comebacks. How God turns setbacks into comebacks. How many of you, you like a good comeback story? Right? It's kind of cool, right? Like last year, we, we uh, went to see the Jets play, and, uh, and they were losing 3-1. It was at the end of uh, the third period. Uh, some people were already exiting out. They were leaving the game because the game was, seemed to be done. And then uh, the Jets scored, and then a few seconds in the game, they scored again, and MTS Center was uh, roaring, it was like, it was very loud, it was very exciting, and it went in overtime, and they won, and it was pretty cool, right? It was such an exciting uh, moment just to see that comeback, and I believe those that went back home and left early uh, probably looked at their phone, not while they were driving, okay? And they probably said, ah, we missed that comeback. And and they did. It was a great moment. But comebacks are cool. But to have a comeback, there's going to be some setback, right? If you don't have any setbacks, there's not going to be a comeback. So so we we, we like the comebacks, right? We like the comeback story, and it's amazing. and, And I think we should. But at the same time, we've got to know that when it comes to life, there's going to be some setbacks. And, uh, and I think that's a huge uh, story or a huge, a, a huge topic. If I would have coffee with you and, and you would tell me, uh, Pastor, can you talk to me about what is the most important thing to, to, to know or to live or to be aware of when it comes to following God? I would tell you first that you have to know that you're loved by God, right? I think that's fundamental. I need to know that I'm valued by God and I'm dearly loved by him that uh, it's not about works, it's not about deeds, it's about grace, that I'm valued by him just because he loves me. And that should be my foundation. That would be what I would tell you first to say, hey, you have to know, no matter what, that you're loved by God. Even though if you walk away, even though you're not where you should be, he still loves you and he cares for you and he wants your best. That would be fundamental. The second thing I would tell you is that uh, you're not alone. That God's desire through history was to be with us and to the point that we are now uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can't get closer to that, right? To be, to be the habitation of God. And I, w- I would tell you that you have to know that you're not alone, that God is with you, and that is God is walking with you, that God can empower you, God can lead you, you can be inspired by him. You're not alone this, in this journey of life. The third thing I would tell you is that you were made uh, for purpose. You're significant. You are important in God's plan. That God has put a call on you and that you're not here by accident. You're not an error. You were planned by God and you were placed with purpose and significance. And I think that's a huge component, right? To know that we're, we're not here by accident. To know that God has a path before me. I'm called to run the path that God has set before me. So I would tell you this. And lastly, what I would tell you that's not the least, I will tell you that you will experience setbacks. That you will experience tribulation. That it's not going to be easy. There's going to be some challenges. I look back at my journey, and I was able to do that during the holidays, looking back at faces, people that I know from my past. And at the same time, I, I was excited. And at and, and and, and some point, too, I was hurt a bit or, or um, uh, how could I say that? I, I was kind of touching my heart to see so many people walking away from the faith. And one of the reasons why is because I believe people did not uh, expect that they would have challenges. They, would not ex- they did not expect that it would not be easy. It's like, for example... I don't know if you are an MMA fan, but let's say you are an MMA fighter and you go in the, in the oxy, ox, oxygon, right? You go and you, and you go for a fight. Uh, there's a good chance you'll be hit on the nose. There's a good chance that you, you'll be hit and, and you'd, you can't be offended because that's part of, of, of the arena, right? You go there and, and if you go in that ring, there's a good chance that you, you'll get hurt. It's part of the deal. It's... 
I, I think about fishing. I used to do a lot of fishing when I was a kid. And um, many times I had a, a bird's nest in my reel. You know where the string goes all wild? And it's, it's kind of part of fishing, especially when you have a new, new strings, right? Or when your string is very old. It's, you, you, you can have a, a bird nest in, in your string. And when you go fishing, there's a good chance that you will get snagged. If you fish with a pickle rig and you fish in the bottom, there's a good chance that you'll get snagged. And it's part of fishing. That's why you bring extra pickle rigs. Because you'll, you'll lose your manual, you'll lose your, 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 your outfit. It's part of fishing. If I go fishing, for example, and I expect everything to be peachy, I'm, I'll be frustrated all the time. I'll be upset. I'll be throwing my rod here and there and my fishing net or my tackle box. You know, I have to know that when I, when I fish or when I do stuff, there's going to be some opposition and there's going to be some challenges. It's part of life. And I need to, to take a hold of that. I need to realize that. I need to keep that in the back of my mind. When it comes to do God's will, when it comes to have a healthy marriage, when it comes to having a successful business, when it comes to fulfilling what I'm called to fulfill, it's not going to happen without any struggles. It's not going to happen without challenges. And I have to be aware of that. And if I'm aware of that, and I live life with that knowledge, I think I'll be way more happier I will be way more fruitful, way more effective, and I will be able to stay on track. Tell your neighbor that you want to stay on track. You want to stay on track. Look what it says in John 16, verse 33. Jesus is preparing his disciples. You have to realize that Jesus said, you will do greater things than I. That's pretty amazing, right? To see God work through the church and fulfilling uh, the ministry or the calling to see God supernatural work through us is amazing. And we want to see that. We want to see God empower us so that we can be fruitful, right? So that we can multiply. But we got to be aware of John 16, verse 33. In the world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Saying that I'm going to be with you, but you will have trouble. You will have challenges. You will face a position. And I need to prepare myself mentally that that will happen. It's part of the gig. It's part of life. And I can't be surprised by it. And I can't see where, God, how come? It's part of it. Jesus prepared his disciples that it would be a challenge. Look at Jesus' example. He was, he was God. And he came to fulfill the will of his father. And he was rejected by his family, Right? He was rejected by the religious leader that should have known better. He was betrayed by a friend, by a close friend. And he injured Calvary, but he stayed focused. He didn't let the setback define his life. He knew that there was going to be some setback and some challenges, but what he did, he focused on the prize. The reason why you don't want to make setbacks your home is because of the goal you want to reach. For example, you want to have a healthy marriage, right? So you strive to have a healthy marriage. So you want to go beyond the setbacks. You want to deal with the setbacks. You want to address the setbacks, but you don't want to make your setback your home. Let's say that your setback is not supposed to be your finishing line, right? Imagine a business owner that says, you know, my goal in life is to have a setback. And when you hit the setback, you say, hoo hoo, job finished or job accomplished. No. The goal of life is not a setback. The goal of life is to fulfill what you're called to fulfill. But in that process, there's going to be some setbacks, right? I like what it says in Isaiah 43, verse 1. One of my favorite texts that helped me as I journeyed as a pastor for the last 30 years. It says, he's talking to Israel, but I think it's so powerful when it comes to understanding how we should see life. It says, but now... That is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, and formed you, O O Israel. And I think he's talking to us too, that he formed me and made me. And God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. I have called you by name. You're mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through through the rivers, they will not sweep you over. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burnt or consumed. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Beautiful text, right? You go through water, you're not going to be submerged. 
You go through fire, you'll not be consumed because I'm Yahweh, meaning that, saying that I, uh, uh, Yahweh means I am, I am with you. So I need to know that God is with me, but I will go through hardship, I will face difficult time, and I gotta stay focused on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith, right? I think it's so huge. If you wanna show the arrows in the back, what people think success looks like, they think it's like this, this arrow, the first arrow. But really, it's not rea- that's not reality. It's not, a, it's not going to be like that. You look at marriage, I remember when I got married 30 years ago, I thought it was going to be like the first arrow. But I didn't, it didn't take me, take me very long that I realized it's not, it was not going to be like that. I remember the first two years, we, we, have, we had some struggles. I, I, I was the youngest of a family, and I had four sisters, so I was kind of the king of the house, right? I didn't do anything. I was served, and I expect my wife to do the same. It didn't work very well, right? It's not a good recipe for success, right? So I expected to see my marriage be like that. When I started ministry, I was so pumped, and I thought it was going to be like arrow number one. But I realized that it's not arrow number one. It's really the second arrow. And I need to realize whatever it is before me, my business, my marriage, my calling, my personal growth, it's not going to be like the first arrow. It's going to be like the second, second arrow. And even in the life of Jesus, it was like a second arrow. So the thing is, one of the lies that we buy in, I don't know why, we, we think or we accept in the back of our mind that life will be like the first arrow. And then we get disappointed, we get hurt, we get frustrated. And then we experience setbacks, and then what happens is that we dwell in that setback, and we think life is that setback. No, God has called you to be victorious. God has called you to have a comeback. But you need to understand that it's going to be like the second arrow. You need to accept the fact that life is not going to be easy, that life will have challenges, that when you look at the, 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 the cake mix, there's going to be an ingredient that will put, be part of that cake mix, and that will be challenges and, and setbacks. And I need to know they will happen. All right? And when I take a hold of this truth, when I look at marriage and I know there's going to be some setbacks, when I look at ministry, when I look at, 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 at business or, or job or work, whatever it might be, when I understand that, then when it happens, I don't freak out. I don't lose the north, right? I say, hey, okay, there's a setback here. God, what do you want to do through this? Uh, what is your plan? Uh, what do you want to fulfill and accomplish through that setback? So it's important for us to get a hold of that. And I'm sharing my heart to you because I've seen so many people think that error one is life. And they get hurt so badly and they miss out the mark. They get derailed of God's will. They get derailed when it comes to the relationship because they have this preconceived idea that it was going to be peachy. Okay, but it's not. But at the same time, God has called us to be victorious, so we got to realize that God has a path of victory for us, but it's not gonna come, it's not gonna happen by itself. You will have to make decisions, you will have to make a stand, you will have to, to, uh, to roll your sleeves and to respond to God's call. Look what it says in Proverb 24, verse 16. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. I like this, eh? They will get up again, but one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. So the godly will get up again. And that's the mindset that we need to have. Wherever, whatever we're facing, we need to have this mindset of getting up again. That's my calling. I'm not going to let setback become my finishing line. I won't let setbacks become my destination. It's part of my journey, but it's not my destination. Right? Right? It's there before me. I can't deny it. I can't close my eyes to it. It's real, but it's not where I'm going to stay. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to walk through this. I will conquer this. I will see God's will be done because there's too much at stake, right? So we want to have that, that mindset. It's to live for God's glory. Um, I, I like this history, this history event that happened in 1643. It would be so awesome if government would do that today. But the English government pulled together some of the greatest theologians and 
biblical scholars of that day, and, and, uh, and they asked these guys to come up with what is the chief end of man, wise man on earth. And after such study, they came to an answer, only 11 words. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, to live for God's glory. So that's what we're called, and I think they're right, because you look at the story of the Bible, it's about giving glory to God. And God has called you to live for his glory. God has called you to live for his glory in, in, in view of your marriage, in view of your finances, your calling, your personal freedom, your life. God has called you to live for his glory. And there's a battle going on. So what, what happens here, we don't want to be caught in a setback that will prevent me and you of living for his glory, right? We want to overcome the setbacks. We want to move forward so glory will be given to him in, in our marriage, in our relationship with our kids, uh, when it comes to our calling and, and all these, and all when it comes to, to life. So what I'd like to focus on right now, I'm laying the foundation for the next few weeks, I'd like to talk about what causes setbacks. And you can follow me in the bulletin, I've got all my notes there. So what causes setbacks? Well, sometimes they're self-inflicted, is when we make bad decisions, <laughs> you know? It would be so cool if we could say that we never do, we never make stupid decisions, right? But the problem is we all make bad decisions. And, and sometimes that creates a setbacks, right? When we don't go to God, we don't follow his leading, we don't walk according to his principles, what happens is that uh, sometimes we get emotionally, uh, emotionally driven or we respond or we react instead of having God's advice. It's like calling someone when you shouldn't because you're angry and then you regret what you've said, right? That's a bad decision, right? But the thing is, when it comes to bad decision, it might be a setback, but you serve a God of grace, right? And you want to be able to move and, and not live with a violin in your hand, and live in self-pity. You want to be able to move forward. Think about Peter. And Corey gave, talked a bit about uh, Peter uh, last week, where Peter had a good intention of, of following God, and Jesus talking about his death, and he said, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for you. And finally, we know the story that he betrayed the Lord three times. And it was a great fall. It was a great setback. And it was really a selfish behavior. He was thinking about self-preservation, right? He wasn't, ta he wasn't thinking about following Jesus. He was on survival mode. And what happened is that he, he experienced a setback but what a great comeback in the book of Acts, right? When he stands before the Hellenist Jews and he preaches the good news and multitude experience God, right? What a comeback. He didn't stay in his self-pity. He didn't stay in his bad decision. He moved forward and said, God, I want to move forward. Even when Jesus said, do you love me? He was not even, even able to say, I love you like with the agape love, but he said, I love you, feel you love as, as a friend. He, he knew that he had come short, but he was able to bounce back. I like that. So he didn't stay in the, in, in the setback of, of, um, of making the bad decision. He moved forward. A another setback that we might experience is unexpected circumstances. When things happen beyond our control, right? when you get hit by sickness or by the economy when it comes to your business or even the weather uh, or a change of job description at your workplace and it's, your world is changing and it's not your fault and it just happens. What do you do? What do you do when that happens? And it's gonna happen somehow that things will happen that we're, we haven't prepared ourselves for or we were not expecting to happen. And, and, it, and, and, and what do we do when that happens? There's a story in the Bible that gives us a little snapshot of that. It's a story of Jesus where he's asleep in the boat and, and they're crossing the, uh, the Lake of Galilee and it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 24, it says, suddenly, a fierce storm, suddenly. When they crossed, when they went on the lake, they, they thought it was going to be fine. But suddenly, it says, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat and Jesus was sleeping. If you look at the story from Mark's Angle in chapter 4, verse 38, it says, Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? 
And, and Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, come on guys, where's your faith? Where's your faith? What he was saying to them, don't you know that I'm in your boat? Don't you know I'm there? I'm in your boat. Don't you know that I did not come to die on the lake? That I came to fulfill the, the will of my Father? Don't you know that you have a calling on your life? That I've called you to be my disciples and to go into the world? Don't you see the plan? And what happens sometimes is that we get caught, listen to this, we get caught in the moment and we don't see what God has in store. So when we experience something that holds us back or when we experience a setback, we got to know that God is in my boat. Can you tell your neighbor that God is in their boat? God is in my boat. God is in my boat. I'm not alone. I'm not called to do it on my own. I'm not called to survive on my own. God didn't kick me out and say, hey, fly, be free. You know, uh, for those that watched Mork and Mindy many years ago, that was kind of the, for those, yeah, for the older, older crowd, um, you would get that, right? But God, God is with you. So when you experience things that you did not plan, you got to stop and say, God, what are you up to? Where are you in this? And you know what you will discover? You will discover that he's with you. And it's going to be a peace that transcends all of your understanding. There's going to be a joy in the tribulation because you know that he's in your boat. You know that he will carry you through. You know that he will bring you to the other side. Sometimes you don't know what the other side is, but you know that it's going to be good because he's with you. You know that he will glorify himself through your life. So you want to face setbacks with the thought, with the belief that God is with you. The third setbacks that you might experience is through the decisions of others. When people make bad, bad decisions and they influence you. I don't know if it ever happened to you in your business. Maybe your employer made a bad decision and it affects you. And you say, man, they should have, I knew all along they should have done that and they didn't do that. I'm pretty good when it comes to hockey, hockey, uh, when it comes to draftings and all that. When it comes to trades, I would be a great uh, a great, how do you call him, uh, manager. Not a manager, but a team something. You know, the, the guy that oversees the team. I, I, f from my house, <laughs> from the TV, that would be really, really good. I, I, I'm amazing. I, I'm amazing, right? <laughs> if they would do what I, what I think they should do, we would win the cup every year. <laughs> but we are influenced by the decisions, decisions of others, and what do we do when that happens? And there's a story of that in the life of, of Paul. Listen, Paul was called to go to Rome to preach the good news to Caesar, to the, to the, uh, the, uh, the leaders of Rome. And he knew at the same time he was going to die. So he's on his way to Rome, and he experienced shipwreck. Like this boat crashed. And, and God, it's not fair. Like, I'm going from, from uh, Judea to Jerusalem, uh, to, to, uh, to Rome, to do your will, and I experienced a, a crash. Why? Why? And, and if you look at Act chapter 27, verse 40, it talks about the crash here, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel to the ground, the bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken by the surf. So he's there, and he experienced shipwreck. And in verse 23 of the same chapter, a little earlier, it says... For last night an angel of the Lord, uh, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And the angel tells him what is going to happen. And even earlier in the chapter, uh, God comes to Paul and he says, hey, you shouldn't go because there's going to be a storm. So he goes to see those that are in charge of him. And he says, hey, there's going to be a storm. We shouldn't go. And they don't listen to him. They go ahead. And later on, Paul says, I told you not to do this because uh, God has spoken to me. And later on, what happened is that he's able to, gi to guide uh, the Roman official that was over him and also the boat. He was able to have influence over them. But you know what? He was a victim of decisions of others. So what do you do when you're a victim of decisions of others? You don't want to wash your hands and say, you know, Oh, it's not my problem, it's their problem, let's, let's them fix it. Or, or you become bitter, and, and, or you become upset, and you lose your effectiveness. What do you do when you experience 
a setback based on what others decided uh, that, that influences you. You, you don't want to shut yourself down. You, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to close yourself uh, up. You, you don't want to let decisions of others define you. Um, you. You think about Walt Disney. He was turned down 302 times before he got financing for Disneyland. 302 times. He didn't let others define what he believed he wanted, what he was called to do, what he wanted to do. I look at Michael Jordan. He was, uh, he was cut off Cut, cut from his high school basketball team. Like, it forced him to work a little f- harder, and, and we know that he changed history when it comes to basketball. So the thing is, you don't want to let the decisions of others create a setback and hold you captive for your life. You want to move on. You want to say, God, beyond this, what do you want me to do? You don't want to uh, justify your, your, uh, your status quo because of the decisions of others. you got to do what God calls you to do beyond uh, what others are deciding. And that's what, the, that's what Paul did. I think it's fantastic. Uh, the fourth setback that we might experience, it's God's bigger plan. What do you mean by this? Is that a setback? It can be a setback for me when we map things out in life without giving God the last word. In other words, when we live life with no margins. That we, when, we, uh, when we live our life just with the obvious, we just do what is before us. What we want to do, listen, I think that's huge. We want to live life with, with margins. That when you go to the grocery store, when you do life, you want to give room for God to speak and lead you. You just don't want to do the obvious and do the status quo, or do the, the minimum, and then say, oh, I, I'm doing life. You, you, you don't want to see that become your setback. Because that can be a setback. You might be missing out on what God wants to do through you when you just look at the obvious and when you just do the obvious. And you have this example in the life of Paul in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, And when they went through the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been, made for, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak to a word in Asia, so the Holy Spirit is saying to them, don't, We don't want you to go to Asia. But Paul wanted to go to Asia, but God had another plan. And when they had come to come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared and, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia to help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. So it was Paul's desire to go and preach the gospel. That's, that's pretty good, right? But God had another plan. So when it comes to life, you, you don't want to live in the setback of just doing your life. You want to be open to what God has in store. I look at Philip. He was having revival in Samaria, and God called him to go on a side road to talk with this Ethiopian leader that became influential in Ethiopia. So why? Because God had something bigger in, in store for him. So the thing is, I don't want just to live my comfortable life. I want to be open to God. I want to live life with, margin, with margins, where I'm able to respond to his call and, and, and follow his prompting. And, and the last position that we face, or the last setback that we can experience, is spiritual opposition. If you want to do God's will, there's going to be spiritual opposition. You know the story of, you remember the story of Joshua and Caleb and the 12 spies? They were part of, of, of a team of, of 12 that went to spy the promised land. And 10 of them came back and said, there's giants in the land. And said, we can't go into the promised land. There's giants in the land. And Caleb and Joshua said, hey, we can do this. God is with us. God showed us in the past that what he's able to do, this land is ours. That's the vision. That's the calling. Let's conquer the promised land. But because of the, of the majority, you know what happened, right? They went back into the wilderness because they were afraid of the giants. I'm going to tell you this. Where, whatever land that, is, that your feet are touching, whatever you go, there's going to be giants. There's going to be giants in your marriage. There's going to be giants in your business. There's going to be giants in your, that are facing inner, your inner freedom. There's going to be giants uh, that you'll face when it comes to fulfilling your calling. There's always giants. And there will always be giants. So what are we going to do? 
Are we going to go back into the wilderness because there's giants? Are we going to say, God, what is your will? What, you've, what have you called me to conquer? So when you look at the giants in your marriage, what you want to do is you want to do like David. Even though you don't know exactly what to do, you take your slingshot out, you take what you have, you take what you've learned, you think, take what you know, and you apply it. And you believe that God will make a way. And the story of, of David and Goliath is such an awesome story of this young dude uh, that killed this giant. And God has called you to be a giant slayer. The last thing you want to do is to live in a setback mode and not believe that you're able to see giants fall. Because whatever, wherever you go, there's going to be giants. Let's say, for example, I struggle in the church here, and, and there's some issues that I struggle with. And I'm going to think by going to another church, I won't have issues. There's always going to be giants. And you might say, you know, if I would have another wife, <laughs> or I would have another husband, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any issues. No, you would have giants there too. You might say, you know, I'm going to jump job and I'm going to take another job because it seems to be always greener in the, in the other yard, right? And you go there and you know what's going to happen? You're going to face giants. You'll have the same people with different names. Wherever you go, same people with different names. So what do you do? You buckle down. You say, what God has you called me to do? Then you respond to God's call and you make a way. And you do what you're called to do. But what you don't want to live by is by the setbacks. You don't want to see the setbacks defining who you are. Amen? I think that's huge. God, God doesn't want you to be a prisoner of your setbacks. And we all have different kind of setbacks. And if you don't, you will. So what are you going to do? You go to God, next week I'll talk about how to deal with setbacks. But what I wanted to do today is I needed, you, I needed to talk about that setbacks are real. It says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life to the fullest. I like part B. <laughs> I love part B. Life to the fullest, hallelujah. Everything goes well, praise God. Yeah. <laughs> but... I need to realize that they're linked. I need to be aware that if I want life to the fullest, there's going to be, uh, I, I've got to have the knowledge that there's a thief that kills, steal, and destroy. I've got to be aware of that. There's a, there's a giant that wants to stand between you and your wife. There's a giant that wants to stand before you and, and, your, and what God is calling you to do in your business or what, wherever God has planted you or in your personal life. There's a giant. So you got to say, God, you've called me to have life to the fullest, and I'm not going to let the enemy win over my situation. I will not let this setback define my destiny. I will not let that setback create a path. I will overcome it. I will conquer it because you're with me. I like what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And Paul is totally aware. He says, Let's, let Satan should take advantage of us so we're not ignorant of his devices or not ignorant of his schemes. I'm, not, I, I'm aware that there's a battle going on. So what do I need to know about setbacks? I need to know that they will come. But I like what Philippians chapter 4, 13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I need to know that setbacks are part of the journey but God has a way, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there's no temptation that will be beyond your strength. God has a way out. All right? Can you tell your neighbor that God has a way out? God knows the trail out. God knows it. And what you want to do is you want to know his will, and you want to come before him. So I need to know that they will come, but they should not dictate my future. They're called to be overcome. Secondly, I need to know that setbacks are temporary. Let, don't let them define you. Don't get stuck in your setback. A setback is not a destination. Setbacks are not my finishing line. If you can remember just this, I did my job this morning. Setbacks are not your finishing line. Nobody starts a business to die in a setback. Nobody gets married to die in a setback. Nobody serves the Lord or to, to, to die in a setback. No way. You can't prevent them, they're there, but you want to cross it. You want to build a bridge. You want to overcome them. Uh, overcome them. I look at Nehemiah, and, and I could talk only on him when he was called to build a wall. 
It was huge, a lot of opposition. He needed to focus on the wall, not the opposition. At one point he said, Simbala, I have nothing to do with you. I don't have time to spend because I've got a mission here. I've got to build the wall. And he did not fall into that setback. He said, no, I'm going to build this wall. I'm not going to waste time with Simbala. I'm going to do what I'm called to do. He, 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 he had a vision, and he fulfilled that vision. I think it's a fantastic example. So I need to know that setbacks are temporary. So I don't want to let, I don't want to let them define me. And thirdly, setbacks will cause me to grow. They will. And they will make me turn to God. You know what happens in a setback? What is hidden comes to the surface. I see that in my life. You probably see that in your life too, eh? When you hit a, set, a setback, what is the ungodly comes up, and what is godly comes up, right? And the things that are ungodly are there to show me there's things that needs to change in my life. So setbacks is not a bad thing because it exposes my heart condition. And at the same time, it makes me call to the Lord. Sometimes I'm hard-headed. <laughs> I've got to go through a crisis before I turn to him, right? Why? I don't know. I don't know if you're the same, but we have this tendency, right? And I look at the story of Jonah. It's kind of a funny and not. He, he has a call of God upon his life, but he, didn't want, he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He wants him to die and go to hell. So he runs away because he doesn't want to be God's ambassador. And he runs away, and the story is he's thrown out of the boat, gets swallowed by a fish, and this is where he cries to the Lord in chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, verse 7. He says, when my life was, faint, was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. He remembered the Lord when he was in the, in the belly of the fish, right? And a story, what makes me laugh when I, when I look at this, I, I think of how he looked like when he came out of the fish. He was probably, probably white as paper, right? Probably no hair like I do because of the acid in the stomach of the fish. And when he went to Nineveh, they probably freaked out when they saw this white man coming in town with no hair, right? And maybe that helped Nineveh to repent. I, I, I don't know. But, but in the belly of the fish, his life was fainting away, he turned to the Lord. In the crisis, he turned to the Lord. And, 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 and you, want to, you want to turn to the Lord. So if you're experiencing a setback, don't hoard in your heart, you know? Don't become bitter. Turn to God. Believe that God is the God of breakthroughs, that you're more than a conqueror in him, that you can do it. Um, God wants to turn my mess into a message. He wants to turn my setback into a message. God wants to use you. So when you face setbacks or when you experience a mess, God wants to turn it to a message. Because God wants to use you to help other people. So you, there's something we can learn from setbacks. We get better in what, in what we do, but we also can train the next generation based on what we went through. Just to conclude this, uh, this morning, don't be content to live in a setback. Don't live in setback mode. Don't say, oh, well, that's life. I guess it's going to be like that for the remaining of my life. And you settle in a setback. Don't settle in a setback, please. Don't say, oh, I'm happy with a setback when God has a comeback for you. Don't let your setback define you. Don't let it paralyze you. And finally, don't let the setback be your finishing line. Let God come in. Go to him. Experience him. Realize, yeah, they're part of life, but they're not called to define you. Amen? I would ask you to stand. Father, you're so amazing, you're so good to us, and we, we thank you for your grace, we thank you for being here. We thank you that you are there to rescue us, that you have a comeback for us, that you have things in store. And Father, we don't want to dwell or to be content to say life is like this and just to be content with the setback. Father, we want to step in what you have in store, there's too much in stake. Father, we don't want to be intimidated by the giants. We want to believe that in you all things are possible. Father, we, we want to believe that you're in the boat even though there's a storm. 
Father, I pray that we would be a people of perseverance, of patience, a people that sees you, that keeps their eyes on the altar and the, the perfecter of their faith. Father, I just pray that we would not live a, a shallow life, but we would go deep, that when the wind comes, when the storm comes, we would stay put. We, will, we would stay focused in you, and we would say, this too will pass. This too will pass. I will see the glory of the Lord again. I will see the breakthrough of the Lord again. Father, I pray for that determination for people in marriage, in their, mar their marriage this morning. I pray for those that feel like giving up when it comes to their own personal growth, or those that are struggling in their business and, and they feel discouraged by the circumstances that are around them. I pray, Father, that they would have a download from you. I pray that you would quicken their hearts this morning not to give up. Father, that we would be prepared for setbacks and that we would have a heart, a heart that believes in comebacks. If you're here for the first time this morning, you've never given your life to the Lord, I don't think you're here. I, I believe that you're, you're, it's ordained by God. You're not here by accident. God brought you here. And maybe you feel like you're in the belly of the well. Like you, life is meaningless and and you've tried everything under the sun and it's not filling the void inside of you. Maybe you walked away from the faith. You, you said you, you, you knew Christ when you were a kid and, and you said, I'm going to do like the prodigal son. I'm going to go try the things in the world. And you live in guilt right now. But I have to tell you, the Father is waiting you. He's waiting for you with his arms wide open. And he's saying, run to me. Let me love on you. I invite you to run to him. If that's you this morning, I invite you just to stretch your hand up. Yeah. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you are in a hard place and, and you're experiencing setbacks. I just pray that something would happen inside of you, that you would, the Holy Spirit would arise in you and you would say, no, this is not the dead end. It doesn't stop here. That as you start this new year, you would have the, the same spirit that took a hold of Samson when he was able to rip doors and, and, and of, of, of cities and, and, and do uh, wonders because the Holy Spirit came upon him. I just pray that the Holy Spirit would arise in you so that you would not let setbacks become your finishing line. I just pray for a breakthrough this morning. I pray for a fresh start. Father, I pray that we would, we would walk a life that focuses on giving you glory and living for your fame. In Jesus' name, amen.
You're not alone in this journey of life. Amen. Don't give up. Don't be content with, uh, with the challenges you face. Go beyond and be victorious in Him. Just to let you know that we have a prayer room in the back. We want to pray for you. And really sometimes we need people to pray with us. And we all need prayer at one point. So if you need prayer, don't, don't be shy. Don't let pride be in the way. Go and receive prayer. All right, have a great week. Thank you so much for coming. Blessings on all of you.